you're still not going to know what he's playing, I promise you. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> one of those things where you're not playing a different strategy just to play something different for the sake of being different. You are trying it, you have a reason to. It has some sort of edge in the meta that you're trying to take advantage of. And we're going to start with game number one here. We'll see if his deck can do what it was built to do and play against the most popular strategy in the current meta. Yeah, he definitely has an edge for sure in this matchup. <laughs> but here we go, Edge, I mean, sorry, Ed. Uh, his deck is Adventure Castira Horus. What does that mean? I'm not sure. We're going to have to find out, but we're going to have to wait a little longer to find out what the strategy is. Matthew is on uh, Castira Snake Eye strategy that we've seen before. It's definitely become one of the more go-to strategies after the FNL list, and he is going to start with Pressure Planet Race Off to add that Castira Unicorn. Castira Unicorn is going to activate the effect to add Castira Birth, more than likely. Right, not going to have to use it immediately, just keeping it in the back as more extension, and then hopefully having some Snake Eye cards to be able to play from this point on. We'll be seeing the normal summon of Snake Eye Ash, potentially a Bonfire be activated, or even just a Wanted. See where he goes next with this. The Canadian Duel with Matthew Bishop. There's the typical Snake Eye Ash normal summon. This is ideal here. And I think this, is, this match is going to be the accumulation of everything we've been talking about up to this point. Ed choosing not to play any of those interruptions from the hand, focusing on beating through the board going second with those powerful spell cards, and he's built his deck around it. He has all those typical engines that you see supplementing uh, other strategies, but instead of just supplementing other strategies, they're supplementing each other and just having all three of them in one deck without any you know, major engine such as Snake Eye. That's right, and having something like the Adventure Engineer, you're not having to rely on your normal summon. Uh, adventure stuff, pretty good going second. You're able to start with that Ride of Ramas here, get access to Draco back. Maybe you can get a Wandering Griffin Rider, and that's all before you start doing the other stuff your deck is attempting to do. So we'll have to see how his deck plays into going second, but Matthew is going to add Snake Eyes Poplar, Special Summon it, and since it was Special Summon, he's going to add Divine Temple, the Snake Eye of the Hand. Looks like he's considering sending the race off with Ash before he plays the Divine Temple, trying to get some value out of his cards here, potentially. But we'll have to see if he values information from Ed before going forward. Because, you know, we know that Ed's not playing any interruptions from the hand, but Matthew doesn't. Definitely want to be diligent here. You do not want to overexpose your resources. Unless he has information prior. Just because, you know, when it comes to Ed, sometimes knowledge just comes out very early. It's are not you, entirely are you, impossible. Are you saying Matthew has perfect information? <laughs> Shoutouts to anybody who might be watching the stream that might know that reference. And now Divine Temple of the Snake Eye is going to replace the Race Off to get Snake Eye's Oak into the Spell and Trap card zone. Snake Eye Ash is going to send the Snake Eye Oak to Special Summon Flame Burge Dragon from the deck. Going to be linking away that Flame Burge and that Poplar here. Into what? Not necessarily sure. Yeah, taking a moment to consider, yeah. See, you, we always talked about you like leaving Flame Burge up on the field to have a little bit of Nibiru protection, but it looks like he is going to ignore that being an option, link away the Flame Burge right away. Maybe this kind of puts him on that he probably has something like Crossout Designator in his hand as well, or he's just wanting to keep the Unicorn on the field to be able to banish something from the extra deck face down. Yeah, we get to use the Poplar here to put the Flame Bridge into the Spell and Trap Zone, so the Temple still has that protection here, so Nibiru, not ideal at this point because he still has the Birth as well. So he's going to summon back Oak and Ash, Snake Eyes, and then he's going to bring back the Snake Eyes Poplar with Snake Eye Oak. From here, the world's pretty much your oyster. He sees that he does have a lot more engine in his hand with an additional copy of Poplar as well as an additional copy of the Right South, but he has an Effect Veiler as insurance. Uh, but outside of that, it's basically going to be what's on the field right here. I mean, that's always like the icing on the top of the cake, right? The cherry on top is when you have those interactions from the hand as well. I think that's how the strategy has been focusing itself. In the previous format, at least, you just want to really play as many of those. Like, and we're reaching numbers that were kind of unheard of up to that point, like we're like 18 copies of those points of interaction, just to make sure your opponent can't get away with anything, but also to combat, like, or to go in combination with your one-card combos, which are so resilient to many forms of interaction, like, assuming they're not just by themselves, because they do pair well with multiple copies, unless it's like the exact same copy. Like two Snake Eye Ash is not ideal, but a Snake Eye Ash and a Bonfire does play through a lot. A Snake Eye Ash and a Wanted does play through a lot. So you have to play so many to actually try and stop your opponent. Like that's where we get to like the ridiculous numbers of 18 to 20. Definitely, and it looks like 
Matthew used the Snake Eyes Oak to summon another copy of Snake Eyes Flame Bird's Dragon from the deck. Uses that effect to put the IP Mask of Reyna in the spell and trap card zone, and now he's going to link away the Ash and the Promethean Princess. Is he going to link into a Link 4 or a Link 2? Looks like it is going to be the Salamander Great Raging Phoenix. Now, at this point, it would be very easy to just have a Nibiru the Primal Being. You're definitely vulnerable to it now because uh, both Flame Bridges will be removed. You are able to special summon the IP Mask Reyna, so you'd have that token and the Birth, but you're at least removing all the Flame Bridges. All right, so he's going to be able to link away the Raging Phoenix straight into World Sea Dragon Zelantis. He's going to use his effect to banish all monsters on the field and then special summon them to the back, or special summon them back into any position he chooses. So it's going to cut or open up his extra monster zone there. Also potentially uh, co-linking SP Little Knight that comes out off of the effect of the IP Mask Arena. Opting to put it in the middle zone, so not going to have the option to uh, protect an Appaloosa if that is what you opt to link for. So... Perhaps a misstep there, or just playing around anima. Oh no, because yeah, yeah, playing around anima potentially. I mean, yeah, if you're gonna go for that, but like, yeah. you always have the option to go for little knight instead. But I, I suppose he's very confident that he's going to uh, go for little knight with that IP mask right now based on this positioning. Definitely, I think that is very heads up to point out there, Asala. And now it looks like I think Matt might have ended his turn and now plays to Ed. Do you think it's correct to not like still hold the birth in your hand, like not try to remove anything from the grave because you do have the unicorn? It's tough because, yeah, especially, well, you don't know what your opponent's playing, but you are playing against Ed Exception, so you think that something crazy might be at hand here, and it is going to start off with M. Seti. I can't see what he discarded. Is it Rainbow Bridge? I think it's Rainbow Bridge of Salvation. Oh, that's so that, many cards. That is a lot of value. That is, an, a, like, is that a plus three, plus two? Uh, so like, <laughs> M. Seti's going to be able to send itself another card from his hand to add the King's Sarcophagus, and then he'll get to draw a card. And the Rainbow Bridge of Salvation, you can banish from your graveyard to add a field spell along with the Crystal Beast from your deck to the field. We saw it be played a lot in tier limits format since you can send it from your deck to the graveyard and then be able to add Pella Rhino. But we're going to see if he's gonna, what he's going to be using it to add here. We already seen M. Seti. He might be using the field spell from Phantom Nightmare, Walls of the Imperial Tomb. This is one of the worst uh, feelings when you're activating Kashir Unicorn and you look at your opponent's extra deck and you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> why is this, Why is the Gurudix in here? <laughs> A lot of Fire King decks don't even opt to play the Sacred Fire King Grunix, but this rank A strategy is going to do it, and he did discard Rainbow Bridge of Salvation. And it looks like we are hitting, uh, I believe that was Numeron Dragon that was rem uh, removed here. That's a good one to get rid of. <laughs> that is a scary one. Anytime you have a rank 8 strategy, you can go into Dragoogleon and then summon Numeron Dragon and attack for a game pretty easily. Looks like he's going to be adding another copy of Pressure Planet Right South of his own, as well as the Crystal Beast Sapphire Pegasus. And I'll let you cut out there everything. Or if I try yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Crystal Beast, Sapphire, Pegasus. And there's a pressure planet. Going to be able to add any Kashira monster here. There's a Fenrir on the top. Is that what he goes for? Or is he a much bigger engine? Yeah, so we see an... Uh, oh, no, it's just going to be the Fenrir. I thought maybe Unicorn comes down, much, seeing a much larger engine. But uh, it's going to leave with Fenrir. So this uh, checks the IP Mascarena fairly well. It'll at least force out the Divine Temple here, so he won't have to summon up the IP with the Flame Burge. So at least he'll be able to go into something like SP Little Knight. But yeah, the, the Vineyard checks that really well, as you mentioned. Cause well, that, yeah, assuming because... At least forces Matt, it out. Matt's going to be the turn player, so he ha if he does opt to make Little Knight, Little Knight will have to be Chain Link 1. Uh, but like, And of course, because IP Mask are going to activate in the previous chain, Fenrir will be able to activate as well. But it looks like we're just going to be using Effect Veiler on the Fenrir, just closing that right now. Heads up play from Matthew, needing that Effect Veiler to shut down the Fenrir, because it definitely dealt with everything kind of all at once. We'll see what else Ed has. We know he has the King Sarcophagus that he added with the M Seti. I mean, that is already pretty good. Yep, as long as King Sarcophagus is on the field to be able to special him back his Horus Monsters from the graveyard, he can also discard a card from his hand. Okay to send more horse monsters to the graveyard, but that's going to immediately prompt Matt to link away the IP Mascarina. I think this is card. correct. I think you try to get rid of Pink Sark as soon as you can. Yep. And Little Knight is one of the only cards that you have access to that can do that. If he has another copy of King Sarcophagus, which he seems to have, that's uh, <laughs> just the worst case scenario, but now we get to uh, go off with the... I'm surprised. He's going straight into the Enchantress. He's not even just using the King Sark to destroy it or like discard it to get maximum value. 
But now, I think he wants to force out more interactions early here. Yeah, I like, I like you mentioned the value thing. I am a fan of Phantom Knights okay. and the adventure cards or the Phantom Knight cards. And then since the horse cards came out, has been a strategy. But here we you know we see Kashira instead of the Phantom Knight cards. But yeah, being able to send that Water Enchantress to the graveyard and then banish it, really useful. But you're going to be able to banish the Enchantress, add Ride of Aramis here. Ride of Aramis here is going to special summon that adventure token. Place Faithful Adventure from the deck face up on the field. So now he's also going to have access to something like Draco back to uh, force out this SP Little Knight. Going to be using the effect of Fateful Adventure now. Right. Do you just go after the Adventure token with the SP Little Knight? Because I'm assuming he's using the effect right now to try and go after Wandering Griffin Rider. He's using the effect to add a monster from his deck to his hand and then send mm -hmm. a card to the graveyard. Yep. Yeah, he's just going to go ahead and remove that token. Token won't come back. Yep, once it's banished, it will not return to the field because it's not an actual monster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't take anything away from our tokens. <laughs> yeah, but once they're banished, they are banished. So now he's just going to be able to... It looks like he's going for another Enchantress here. Just to add and send it for follow-up for the following turn. Decent option here. Not revealing that he has the King's Sarcophagus. Oh, he's going to be discarding the Duamatef. Duamatef is a good one. Uh, if he has access to another King Sarcophagus. Yeah, and, then and he does! This is horrifying on so many levels. <laughs> because not only do you know that multiple of these uh, Horus monsters are going to be coming out, he plays Duamatef, so you know he's playing all four. Yeah, that means Cabeza Nuef is in the waiting as well, more than likely. Yep, Imseti hits the field as soon as priority is passed. My favorite part about the Horus cards is you can make like a rank 8 with a couple of them and leave Happy on the field to where if your opponent does sort of do something to alter your board, you're going to get that awesome effect to add two cards back. But the special summon M. Seti is going to prompt Matthew to use Promethean Princess targeting his Flame Burge and the M. Seti. And now he's going to be able to summon back two level 1 monsters from Flame Burge. And as you mentioned, being co-linked with the World Sea Dragons Atlantis uh, will help him during the battle phase to have a little bit of destruction interruption. Four. Uh, luckily, you know, you don't say luckily too often when it comes to this kind of thing, but it targeting is going to be a big help here because King Sarcophagus does protect the Horus monsters from any effects that do not target them. But Which is just a weird thing to, like, to have as an effect. Right, like reminiscent of Underworld Goddess, but yep. this is the difficult part because he, un like, there is still so much value in the graveyard, but you do have to go after the first Horus monster when it is summoned here because as soon as there's an additional one, uh, trying to remove any of the <laughs> any additional one will trigger the other one. So stuck between a rock and a hard place here. Yep, Snake Eyes, Oak, Ash come out. Ash is going to be able to add another copy of Snake Eye Ash to the hand, and Oak is going to summon back Poplar. Poplar is going to be able to add a Snake Eye Speller Trap. I don't think he used original last turn, so he'll be able to add that. Yeah, definitely lots of follow-up here. We'll see if Ed's able to actually close out the game with the resources he has right now, because I'm not sure if he's going to be able to put up enough interruption to actually keep himself alive if the, the turn goes back to Matt here. He has so many cards in his hand, so many resources available. He does have that Kashir Birth to bring back uh, the, the Unicorn from the graveyard as well. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's any interruption left for Matt besides the Raging Phoenix coming back as soon as the Fire Monster is destroyed. Rises from the ashes just like a phoenix. Okay. But we'll see how Ed's going to deal with this. I mean, that the battle, a lot of the times, like going to like a Seize Monster, trying to find a way to Zeus or something could be something he's looking for. But that battle phase effect of World Sea Dragons Atlantis is huge here. No right, Duamatev hits the field now. What now, do you think he does with the Sapphire Pegasus? Like, is that just the one he chose because it's coolest? He, like, it has the most attack, maybe, to try and do more damage. Is it being a winged or it, is he a winged beast? I feel like that's a winged beast, right? Does that come up? I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I think it's just another card that he can like send to from his hand to the graveyard for Horus. It's the nicest looking one, that's for sure. And it's the strongest. I'm gonna be getting rid of a copy of Foolish Barrel Gets here. Uh, likely does going to mainly be for. That Rainbow Salvation, so pretty useless now at this point. Sends a copy of Happy Guidance of Horus to the graveyard. Okay. Now he's going to send an Enchantress to see if he sends down Cabeza Nuef. Look, you get a little... There's the Cabeza Nuef. That's all four been collected now. Uh, I sent Happy yeah, he's only summoned Duamata. He still can summon Happy and Cabeza Nuef. <laughs> Numeron Dragon, no longer in the extra deck now because of the effect of Kashira Unicorn, but still yeah, plenty of options there if we're looking for just maximum damage. 
Ed trying to make sure he knows what that battle phase effect is for Zulantis. You know, we've talked about Ed's strategies in the past, and I think this is one of his favorite things to do is find just OTK strategies that fit in in a pocket of a format where you're able to just abuse people not being prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Because even though it's not at the point where Snake Eye is the de facto best deck, we're still assuming that it's going to be the most represented and his deck, I imagine, is just built strictly to find a way to OTK through a classic Snake Eye field. Indeed, and two Horus monsters returned from the graveyard to the field. He's now summoned all four of the Horus monsters. There is another one potentially in his deck as well, but doesn't work the same way as these Horus monsters. This one is the one that adds back two, right? Yeah. Yep, want to check which one does what. All they have an effect if another card besides themselves leaves the field, that will activate. So it's good to know which one's doing what. Hoppy being the most dangerous one, being able to potentially banish or to, is it put two from the banish or graveyard back in the hand or back in the deck, I believe. And then I'm not... Yep, you get it. it's a choice between your hand or deck, yep. And I don't really remember what Kabesnu F and Duamatev do. They have good effects, that's for sure. We can pull up the one of them. I mean, oh, Imseti destroys a card. Yeah, Imseti destroys a card. Duamatev, I believe, gains a certain amount of attack for every horse monster. Yeah, it control. gets really big. Yeah. yeah. Kabestinov has played a lot less than the other ones. Oh, looks like we're going to go into a rank A here. Ed trying to be really careful. He sees that he's in a powerful position. Oh, he is going into the Garunix rank 8 monster, which I believe destroys all monsters your opponent controls. Uh, Kabestinov is targeting protection from attacks and targeting if another card leaves the field. Makes that sense one, why that's not the most popular one. Yeah, it doesn't. I knew it wasn't something that would be too impactful here, but it definitely has an, uh, an impact, especially when there's a card that might target in a lot of decks. And it looks like, is it a Sacred Fire King Garunix? Yep, it is a Sacred Fire King Garunix. And that's going to destroy all the monsters on the field. We're not playing Fire Kings, but we're summoning them from the extra deck. All right, so he's activating the effect of Poplar here. I think he's also going to be activating the effect of Raging Phoenix. It's protected by uh, King Stark. Poplar is going to be putting that Flame Bridge back in the Spell and Trap zone. Oh, okay, it doesn't seem like... Uh, what are the requirements for Raging Phoenix? Does it have to be exactly one Fire Monster destroyed? Oh, we'd have to pull up the text to know. Have you, uh, do you have the text in front of you? <laughs> I, do, I do think it's just if a Fire Monster control is destroyed. I don't think it has to be exactly one. And there's a Typhon over the Hoppy because it is somehow bigger, and this is just enough monsters to attack <laughs> for the damage. There's so even without the Numeron Dragon, there's so many different ways for his deck to find a way. And you see the Pegasus coming down, and the 1800 attack actually does matter. I wonder maybe if Topaz Tiger he does go to 2000, so maybe that one might do a little bit more damage. Is that just the threshold of just yeah, like finding a normal someone that does enough damage? Yeah, no, the Raging Phoenix is just it can be multiple monsters. This is what I thought. And then going to be able to use the effect of the Sacred Grunix to destroy a spell and trap zone by de uh, detaching oh. a material here. Uh, and that's 18 from the Pegasus. Uh, 27. Poppy gets in as well. Yeah. yeah. 27. Yep. Yeah. And then 38. And the Garunix. And he still has Pressure Planet Wraithoth on the field as well, just adding more damage onto it as yeah, well. The incremental damage. Yeah. Looks like that is going to be enough, and Matt is going to lose here. Game number one, despite going first and playing uninterrupted. No considerations there. We'll have to see if he does consider that option. It's game number two here of round four of YCS Raleigh. I guess the biggest thing that we're looking for is, is he going to change his field at all? Does he think he needs to change anything about his current strategy? Or uh, is there some flexibility in his extra deck to give him more tools to handle exactly what Ed is doing? Yeah, let's think about like what he didn't have. And I think the one thing that was missing is an Appaloosa Bow of the Goddess, right? And that'd be something that can stop the Imseti effect from the hand. Right, so but maybe it's a lot worse than the exactly King Sarcophagus already. Yeah, I mean, if he and already has just, it, it's tough. Or just activating Rite of Rimesphere that's also pretty bad, that you need to make sure you have access to Little Knight in these situations. Like, oh, yeah. I think it's more risky to go for Appaloosa than to just continue doing what he was doing. 
I, I would just like to have the app, the uh, like a full board of like Appaloosa and like the IP mm-hmm. coming up. You know, so you have Appaloosa SP. So you have two chances to cover your bases. We'll have to see how he decides to build his board this time. He can pretty much decide. I think you can determine that uh, Ed's probably not on those interactions from the hand. So he's going to want it for the Black Witch. Send a card from the de- his hand of the graveyard. It looks like it's a Kashira Birth. Doesn't means he probably doesn't have any of the Kashira cards. He's going to be able to set the original Sinful Spoils from the deck. Right. I mean, if he wanted to, he could have activated the Birth and Normal Summon the Diabell Star. But I, I, so this should signify that he has a potential Normal Summon still available. I mean, Snake Eye Ash can always grab you a Normal Summon as yeah. well. Which comes up more so in the Fire King strategy, but it's always nice to have your normal summon in your back pocket no matter what you're using. Yeah, so this is the weaker version of the combo that just leads with Dia Bellstar, but uh, not having the combination. And I think you're right, Matt has seen enough from Ed's strategy based on like, just how much of his deck he saw and like the extra deck. He should know that there's not going to be many of those point interactions from the hand. He's mm-hmm. going to be mainly spell cards and things to interact with the field after it's been made. So he can just go full gas here and try to make as big of a board as he can or make it so that he has as much follow-up as he can to just keep himself alive. And that should be his main focus now. All right. Flame Burge on the field from Snake Eye Ash. He's going to link away the Poplar and the Flame Burge. You know, I talked about him having a potentially like slightly weaker version of the combo in his hand, but then I saw like the rest of the cards in his hand, and I think this is a pretty ideal situation. These these are the cards in combination that should take care of Ed's strategy. He has an Ash Blossom, an Effect Veiler, and a Cosmic Cyclone that checks most everything. So he just needs to deal with the things that he can't check. That's definitely an arsenal to be had in the hand. It's always nice when you draw like the starters plus like all the other cards that can go along with it to back them up. As yeah. opposed to just drawing multiple copies of your starters. Yeah, this is isn't this exactly what you wanted? Oh, you know it. Two starters, three interruptions. That's that's all I'm about. In this case, it was three interruptions, a starter and a half. Like, a starter and a half. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll take one. You, you, the difference with one starter and four interruptions is they could like cut you off, but. The, this is definitely going to be good enough here. We're going to see a Link summon, linking away the Poplar in the IP Mascarena, probably for Promethean Princess, Bestower of Flames. There she is. We're going to be using the effect of Oak here, sending the Flame Burge. Go ahead and grab another one. And this is what we're talking about. Like This is the kind of play you're doing when you're ignoring Nibiru. Yeah, definitely going to put... IP Masquerade in the Spell and Trap Card Zone of Flame Burge. Will we see an Amblo Well? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, you have Raging Phoenix into Zelantis. I think that's enough most of the time. Is that a train? <laughs> no, there's definitely some feedback from the microphone from the main stage. But we are going to see him consider his options. What does he want to do here? Oh, he's bridge. summoning back the oak with Princess? I believe it was the Flame Burge uh, that was linked away. And now he's going to do the Raging Phoenix and Zelantis. He's pretty much doing the exact same thing from game one. Yeah, so now he can reposition everything. And I think he's, yeah, he's just Did going to chill here. He has plenty of... Oh, well, he should definitely use the Wanted to get another draw, right? I think he's about to check that before... Yep, makes sense. He has value where he can. Any (laughs) additional interruption is going to be necessary here. Yeah, so doesn't adapt his turn one board, but has more options from the hand to use. okay, that's good too. Just one more point to add to the collection here. Keep in mind, Asala can see more cards in the hand than we can on the live feed. (laughs) So it's nice to get a little bit of insight into the cards that they have. Uh, I'm seeing what they're seeing. I just like... I know what it looks like. But it looks like Unicorn coming down here from Ed. He broke this board last time. And it looks like Matthew did use Flame Bridge Effect during the draw phase or standby phase to make sure Mascarena was already on the field. Yep, just locking it down with that effect, Valor. Yeah, we saw him Valor the Fin Raider in game one. He's going to Valor the Unicorn here in game two. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Like, there's already a copy of Draco back in his hand. There's already a copy of the Sapphire Pegasus in his hand. It's so easy to draw the wrong half of your combinations here. 
And we'll have to see if Ed has powerful enough interactions to really come back going second into this kind of strategy without anything to actually stop it from getting this far. Yeah, it's a little bit more than last time, but not too much more. It looks like Pressure Planet Race Off coming down next after Ed used the Enchantress to add Rite of Aramis here. That's going to add Kashira Fenrir from the deck to the hand. Not really worried about it, considering the current situation. Definitely not. And now Rite of Aramis here is going to be activated from Ed. Yeah, we did see that there was an Ash Blossom in uh, Matt's hand, but opting not to use it because, again, it's just checked by the effect of SP Little Knight. Yeah, this is good. All right, going to place Fateful Adventure. Yeah, I was like, no, that Enchantress is banished. <laughs> uh, now let's see if he uses Fateful Adventure to try and force something out here to go after Wandering Griffin Rider. Since the Griffin Rider, you can special summon it from your hand if you control the Adventure token, and it offers a uh, negate for anything, monster, spell, trap. This is the slightly more concerning part of this. If you, tr uh, if you try to use your Little Knight Banish on the Adventure cards here, then you will have not well. You will just not have it available for the horror part of the engine. But you do have an Ash Blossom. And you do have a Cosmic Cyclone to try to mitigate that. So I think you're okay to just do so right now. Okay, opting to use the Ash Blossom here. Interesting. Oh, he does already have Draco back in his hand as well. So he's going to be able to equip the Draco back to his adventure token and then force out Matthew's IP Mascarena potentially. It's yeah. tough. I mean, you have to IP the token, I think. Yeah, or I SP. Agree. Yeah, IP into SP for the token. Oh, opting to use just the Ash here, leaving the Flame Bridge available so that there's more ways to put up bodies to keep yourselves... Uh, which makes sense, right? He saw that he went into the Grunix on the previous turn, <laughs> so he wants to have more insurance to keep bodies on the field. <laughs> he doesn't want. He, he he got him in the first half, but he, he's he's aware of what can happen now in game two for sure. This is what we're talking about—that flexibility, right? You need to be able to adapt to your opponent's strategy, be able oh. to do things differently. Yeah, you mentioned the downside to running three engines, where you could draw more of one than the other. But when you draw all three starters for all three engines, three. it's pretty incredible. Did he concede? Yeah, there was a cosmic cycle to check the King Star Conference. Oh, so. oh, the, he cosmic did. Okay. Mm -hmm. I looked away for just a, just a brief second, but that was long enough to miss that Cosmic Cyclone to end the duel. So, so let's jump into it. It's game three, round four, YCS Raleigh. Uh, I feel like these players are more stressed than normal because of the situation here. I think this is a high-pressure game. Even if it is as early as round four, it just feels as pressured as round 11. In a as position like this, what will Matt do? Does he have to go first, looking at his hand? Oh, no. So it looks like, yeah, take a minute to read that and let you know that you can't summon monsters, right? That's what... Yep, you cannot normal wave. summon. <laughs> neither player can normal summon. Essentially, like Cold Wave, but a little hotter. A little hotter, way hotter. It's definitely something we've seen in strategies uh, that are normally go second to catch their opponents off guard. When they make them go first, they can sign in cards like Heat Wave. It might be a card that's going to be gaining popularity with the release of With Legacy Tenpai. of Destruction. Yep, that's right. The Tenpai Dragon strategy, known for needing to go second because it has to go to the battle phase to win the game. But if you force them to go first, they do have this ace in their back pocket, Heat Wave. And Ed preemptively already including that in his deck. We'll it makes sense, see. right? He's playing adventure cards. You are allowed to summon normal monsters. So you are able to activate the Fateful Adventure, put the token on the field, keep the Griffin Rider for your opponent's turn. Well, not that you'd be able to activate it then either, but you just have a body that does something relevant. You're not going to be able to do anything else with it, but you are able to activate whilst the Imperial Tomb, which is essentially King Sarcophagus yeah. while on the field. It literally, yeah, it literally <laughs> counts as King Sarcophagus on the field and lets him access M. Seti from the deck by just adding a Horus monster and then placing a card back to the deck. There's going to be that Rainbow Bitch Salvation here. A lot of value here. These, these are the high value turns that Ed wants to see. And the wall, we saw another copy of the Walls of the Imperial Tomb. There's the King Sarcophagus again. Going to discard the Pegasus he just added. Sins Duamatev. And gets rid of the Fenrir. Won't be needing that anytime soon. Just setting up for next turn. 
Yeah, the hope with Heat Wave here is even if you are not able to develop too much yourself, your opponent will likely be able to develop absolutely <laughs> nothing. And so you get to go just straight into the battle phase with a bunch of large monsters and be able to end the game as quickly as you can. I like this is something a lot of players have been talking about for the Tempai Dragon strategy that's coming. But, you know, Ed's saying I don't have to wait for Legacy Destruction. I'm showing you that you can use this with. And this is something that's been viable, like, even before our Forbidden Limitless. It really just shows you there's so much more than what you see that is viable. There's innovation, there's room to be had to find find new ways to uh, play the game, which I love. I feel like Snake Eye has a somewhat acceptable answer to Heat Wave in Temple. It, once they start summoning on their turn, you can at least put some bodies on the field. That's a good point. But I think I did see Matthew draw quite a couple answers into the current situation. So we'll see if he's able to get his way through. Yep. Cosmic's a good one. One Cosmic Cyclone down on the field spell here, removing one King, Sarf King Sarcophagus, but there is still another one. You're going to want to be able to get rid of that too, so make sure that there are no resources remaining. Sets a couple cards face down. All right, pa All right. turn passes to Ed here. Will there be anything prior to the main phase? Nope, so going straight into the main phase. The Fenrir comes down, which makes sense. He did give up one already, so high chances of being multiple. I wonder if there's any merit to summoning a Horus monster first. That way, if there is like a Cosmic Cyclone, you would at least get the effect of a card leaving the field. Well, you can't summon the Fenrir if you use. Oh, summon. that's true. Yeah, that you'd have to decide you're not going to use Fenrir at all. Which I think, honestly, the value of a single Horus monster might have been worth it. And if I'm very surprised because we saw Matt does have another copy, copy of Cosmic Cyclone. I'm surprised he's leaving the King's Office on the field this long. Yeah, he could have also draw phased yeah, the Cosmic too. Yeah. Oh, and he's oh. using the Mortar. <laughs> Triple Tactics talent. To look at the hand, there is a Diabell Star as well as the Poplar. Just going to go ahead and put the Diabell Star back. I, I, Not that it really matters here. Fenrir, uh, oh, Fenrir's just going to be chilling. So here comes Duamatef. Okay. And it looks like Matt wants to think in an open game state after the resolution mm -hmm. of I can't imagine him not activating talents. the Cosmic Cyclone here. He needs to really limit what Ed can do, because as soon as multiple of those bodies hit the field, there's not going to be much Ed, uh, Matthew can do to keep himself alive. Yeah, the Horus cards are really strong. I'm a big fan of them. I, like, I guess if you had to say any of those engines would be the main one, it has to be the Horus one, right? Oh, he's, yeah, for sure. I mean, sure. he's, he's playing the, the full Horus engine. He's like <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's letting it all happen. Okay. That is three large bodies. Did I... Did I miss see that? Like I, I could have sworn that was a cosmic cycle inside, but maybe it's not. Must not be. And now it looks like uh, it has so one. many monsters on the field. Looks like he's looking at the extra deck, how to clean up the board before trying to go to the battle phase. He's going to go into Galaxy Eyes Photon Lord. Very surprising, considering he saw his opponent's hand. Oh, OK, uh, never mind. My full bad. Full armor. Bad. <laughs> full armor Photon Dragon. There's going to be the infant permanent. It's going to be able to cut off the King Sarcophagus as well, but it doesn't change its name. You can attack directly. We'll definitely be able to still access more of those rank gates that on that can just put on top of uh, the full armor photon dragon. I'm sorry, this yeah, uh, the imperm. Honestly, kind of surprised that Ed didn't just enter the battle phase. The monsters were pretty big already, right? Oh, one face up. Sorry, I got another one. I right, just clarifying something here real quick, and then yeah, just attacking. And that's it. Ed takes it with <laughs> his Kashtiro Horus strategy. Adventure too. Don't forget the adventures. They were they were there. Enchantress. They mainly used just to force out the interaction.